So welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. We're starting again, and we have an exciting term coming up today. It's wonderful to have Norman Yao, who's a new professor at Harvard, just moved to Cambridge in January from Berkeley. And he is going to tell us about what is a time crystal. Norman, why don't you share your screen? And All right. happy year of the tiger. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, um, happy new year, everybody. As, uh, as Arthur mentioned, um, it's really great to, to be here to, to talk a little bit about some work that's been going on in my group for a couple of years now. Um, and in particular, it's about something called a time crystal, which depending on who you talk to is either the best or the worst name ever. And I'm not sure which camp I quite fall in yet. Uh, the work is based upon a number of collaborations, at least the, towards the second half. Um, the first part will be based upon some work with Chaitan Nayak and Leon Balance. And then um, and the second part will be based on work with Francisco Machado and Trintao Drong. And both, uh, and there's sort of longstanding collaborations with my former colleague at Berkeley, uh, Mike Zalatel. So let me start um, by emphasizing that I was fretting quite a bit the last couple of days over how exactly to tell this story to the audience that's uh, assembled here. So I will try to start very hard by getting us all on the same page. So I apologize you know, if some of the beginning will be sort of very familiar to many of you, but I really want to make sure that the language that we're using to describe the physics is, um, is common. And the most important thing that I'll try to get across today is when the question of time crystals is interesting and non-trivial. Even if I don't get into the results, that's okay. So please ask questions. Stop me, feel free at any time, just call out, ask questions, especially in the beginning part where I'm trying to lay out what exactly is the non-trivial facet of the question that we're trying to answer. Good, so let's jump in with a quick roadmap. Um, I'll start off, as I mentioned, with a hopefully a relatively clear and long discussion about what is the specific question and when it is non-trivial. Then I'll talk about um, a little bit of uh, perhaps, you know, the, the, the existence of time crystals in dynamical systems that people have explored for a long time. And I'll take as a case example, the logistic map. And then I'll move on to sort of um, the brunt of modern research on this topic, which is looking at closed periodically driven many particle systems. And here we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what the implications of the general notion of ergodicity is and how that implies a phenomenon that these days is called flow K heating. And finally, I'll sort of end with a mantra, which is that where there is, wherever there is ergodicity breaking, there will be time crystals. And I'll look um, specifically at the case of flow K Langevin dynamics. So let me start, you know, by zooming out a ton and just, I know the audience is very diverse. It's been emphasized to me by Arthur many times. So I want to start with just trying to make sure that we have a common language in terms of how to describe phases of matter. And this is not the language that everyone uses. So it's a little bit more of a condensed matter physics type of language. And in the context of condensed matter physics, symmetry plays an essential role and phases of matter are often thought in terms of the notion of the spontaneous breaking of said symmetries. And I'll try to unpack a little bit why that is the case. So I'll start with something that's very familiar to all of us, the pressure temperature phase diagram of all water. You see three different colors representing three different phases, solid, liquid, and gas. And of course, if you want to go from a solid phase, for example, to a gas phase, there are these thick black lines that represent phase transitions. So crossing from one phase of matter to another requires you to go through a phase transition. Except if you notice the pesky top right corner, it turns out that there looks like there's a way to get around the phase transition and to go from the liquid to the gas phase without going through a phase transition. And my claim is that you know, this difference between solid and gas and liquid and gas can be understood in terms of symmetry breaking and order parameters. So, let me highlight this distinction a little bit more um, in a little bit more of a poignant fashion. And I claim that in particular, if one has you know, a system of particles and one is looking at two phases of these particles in general, so liquid, gas, and solid, that if you look at some tuning parameters, in this case, I've drawn pressure and temperature again, 
that if you want to go from a solid to a gas, you will always need to go through a phase transition. And this has to do with symmetry breaking. But it turns out that if you want to go from a liquid to a gas, that generically you can go through a phase transition depending on where you are in the phase diagram, but oftentimes there will be a path that allows you to skirt this. And it turns out that the way to understand the distinction um, between these two transitions and these phases of matter can really be understood very well in terms of symmetry breaking. So let me just define what I mean there. The setting for the problem is that we imagine that you know, there are some properties of a many particle system that we're interested in. These could be static or dynamical properties. And these properties are governed by equations of motion. And you know, this is the way we always start out. For most of this talk, I'll be thinking about equations of motion in the form of just a Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is said to exhibit a symmetry if there exists a particular transformation that keeps the equations unchanged. And it turns out the magic of low temperature physics and symmetry breaking is that the state of the many particle system, oftentimes we're tuning temperature, that's maybe the one that's most well known in physics, oftentimes upon cooling down the system, the state of the system can break this symmetry, which means that it exhibits a smaller symmetry group than the underlying equations of motion which govern its static and dynamical properties. And this is, for example, precisely the case of a solid, where if you looked at you know, if you were able to zoom in microscopically and looked microscopically at the average location of the particles, the density, you would find that in some locations there are atoms and in some locations there are not. Whereas in the gas, if you average and you look at this, the density of particles is always the same. So this notion of symmetry breaking can be typically measured via a local order parameter, and that order parameter is what defines a so-called phase of matter. So let me turn um, to the original setting where time crystals were thought about. So let me just emphasize one more time that in the case that we were just talking about, the symmetry that was being broken by the density pattern is the continuous translation symmetry of space. So the equations of motion, of course, are invariant under the continuous translation in space. But in the end, the solid, for example, breaks that because the density pattern does not respect that symmetry. So whenever you find symmetry breaking, oftentimes we think about it within this kind of Landau-Ginsberg classification of phases of matter. So let me now turn to the original setting where people were interested in thinking about and coined the term time crystals. It was an idea, actually it turns out ex exactly a decade ago um, that was proposed by Frank Wilczek and, and Al Shapir and Wilczek. And the question was whether or not you could get the spontaneous breaking of a time translation symmetry in a classical or quantum many body system. And this really, you should think directly analogous to spatial translation symmetries, which we were just talking about. Here, instead of the Hamiltonian or the equations of motion being independent and unchanged by translations in space, the idea is that if you start with a time independent Hamiltonian H, then it exhibits a continuous time translation symmetry if you change time you know, by t goes to plus delta t, the equations of motion stay unchanged because the Hamiltonian is in fact time independent. And the question was whether or not their states of the system or the ground state of the system could exhibit observables that exhibit oscillations despite the fact that the Hamiltonian is time independent. Okay, So it's really a very, very simple idea. You have a time independent Hamiltonian and the question is, if you look at the ground state, are there local observables that are periodic in time or exhibit some non-trivial time-dependent structure despite the fact that the Hamiltonian is time invariant? Of course, we know from you know, your first course in quantum mechanics that the ground state here, time evolves by simply picking up a phase, which is the energy of that ground state, which means that immediately something like the first line that I've written here is impossible. There can be no oscillations here. A slightly less trivial question or a slightly less trivial pair of questions is can you have a two point or multi point correlation function in the ground state that exhibits an oscillation? Or in general, if you start with the thermal state e to the minus beta h for some inverse temperature beta, can there be again a multi point correlation function that exhibits some non trivial oscillation? And I think that probably many of you immediately feel, well, this would be pretty surprising because it feels kind of like 
you're getting oscillations or motion for free in these types of a system. And indeed, that's, that's an accurate intuition or a gut feeling that you have. Just a couple of years later, I mean, already when Frank and Al put out their idea, it was very subtle, but I think there were questions from the community about you know, various limiting cases that didn't seem like um, they fit the mold. And this all culminated in a very nice no-go theorem by Haruki Watanabe and Masaki Oshikawa in 2015, where they proved precisely that time dependencies, you know, in the ground state or in thermal states were impossible. So since then, the question has changed precisely because um, the original question kind of has this no-go theorem. And the question started to be asked about whether or not equilibrium or time independent Hamiltonians are too restrictive of a landscape to ask about the question of time translation symmetry breaking. And in particular, it turns out that the slightly more modern question that people have been asking is a totally different you know, landscape than the question was originally being asked in. And in particular, the modern landscape of time crystals has been in the context of non-equilibrium systems. And it turns out that perhaps the simplest and most, yeah, most, mo mo most not dramatic way of taking a physical system out of equilibrium is to periodically drive the system. So for the remainder of the talk, the, um, the situation we're gonna consider is a situation where we still have a many particle system. It will be either classical or quantum, but the equations of the motion will no longer be time independent, but they will cycle back to themselves. So we have basically moved ourselves into the realm of Floquet physics, where we have a periodically driven Hamiltonian such that the equations of motion return back to themselves after some big period T. Okay. So we might say, so this is the setting for today's talk, and you might immediately say, well, isn't it true that if I have a uh, periodic driving, that time translation symmetry, the time translation symmetry of the Hamiltonian is already broken in such a system. I mean, the Hamiltonian only comes back to itself every period T. So there is no true continuous time translation symmetry. And you're absolutely right. So one movement away from the original kind of Wilczek Shapiro question is that now the question about symmetry breaking is no longer a question about symmetry breaking of a continuous translation symmetry, like it was for solids in the case of the example that we gave at the very beginning of the talk. But now it turns out that the question will be related to the discrete, the breaking of a discrete translational symmetry, and in particular, a discrete time translational symmetry. This is again, not magical at all and extremely, you should feel it in your bones very easily. It turns out that I'm just gonna make a super quick analogy to, uh, to space one more time. That in fact, you know, you're very familiar already with the breaking of discrete translational symmetries. If you think about any underlying system that has a lattice, here I've drawn a, okay, a slightly complicated one, it's called the Kagame lattice. You can imagine that there is an underlying lattice structure on top of which particles or electrons are moving around. They can either form a disordered pattern or a more liquidy pattern or it turns out that um, the pattern of the electrons, for example, can break the already discretized translation symmetry of the Kagame lattice into a further density wave pattern. So this is a simple example of uh, you know, an interacting set of particles. In my mind, I'm often thinking about electrons that, for example, forms a um, density wave pattern and thus breaks a discrete lattice translation symmetry of the underlying Kagame lattice. So this means that in the context of time crystals and in the context specifically of time crystals and periodically driven systems, and in analogy to the picture that I just showed, the question now is you have a discretized time translation symmetry. So think about your equations of motion as being an update rule that is discrete time. So some simple discrete time map is just enough. But the idea now is, is there a state in the system or can the system form a steady state where the steady state, for example, exhibits um, oscillations that are double the period or a multiple periodicity of the underlying translate of the underlying time translation symmetry. So again, in the language of a space, we can have, for example, a one dimensional pattern where we form a density wave pattern of particles on top 
And here we think about that being the discrete breaking of a spatial translation symmetry. And in time, the question is, are there observables of the many particle system that come back to themselves, but only come back to themselves every, for example, other period. So in this particular context, the definition at some level of the order associated with the time crystal in a periodically driven system is the emergence of subharmonic oscillations that are subharmonic of the underlying periodicity of the driving field. In this specific example, and for most of the talk, I'll focus on the simplest subharmonic, which is the one half subharmonic. So I'll oftentimes change, exchange subharmonic with the word period doubled. So let me just try to be once again, sort of repeat the context of the question that we've now zoomed into. We started out with this very broad question about continuous time translation symmetry. And now we're asking the question, in a periodically driven system of many particles, um, are there and can there be observables um, in a state of the system which exhibit a subharmonic response, also known as oscillations, at a fraction of the driving frequency? As soon as typically in most talks, as soon as I get to this question, the gut reaction now that you have is that oscillations are everywhere. And uh, the usual thing that happens is that people start to ask, you know, but Norm, why is, you know, blah and blah and blank sort of not a time crystal? And here is precisely why I think it's really important to zoom into the question that is interesting and to try to explain the non-trivialness of the context. So it turns out that if we really want to think about time crystals as phases of matter in kind of the language of symmetry breaking that we started out the talk with, that we need to have, we need to arm the definition with a slightly, with a couple of extra ingredients. So it turns out that one can't, think about sort of, you know, the breaking of a discrete time translation symmetry as a time crystalline phase of matter, unless one really has a couple of extra ingredients. And these are very natural from a physics perspective, I would say, and they kind of underlie this Landau-Ginsberg theory of symmetry breaking that we talked about in the first couple of slides. So let me go through the ingredients. The first ingredient, which is, you know, kind of clear, is that there should be a well-defined thermodynamic limit. Most of the time, we're not thinking about phases of matter that are defined by you know, single particle systems or you know, a few a two-body system or a residence of a two-body system. So we'd like there to exist some set of degrees of freedom that are interacting with each other locally with a discrete time update rule that arises from interactions of these locally coupled neighbors. Okay? So we'd like to be able to take that thermodynamic limit as the number of degrees of freedom gets very, very large. Um, this is exactly what we just talked about. We'd like for there to be the discrete, this discrete breaking of a time translation symmetry, which means that there should exist for a set of states, a local observable O, which exhibits periodic subharmonic oscillations out to infinitely long times. Ideally, a time scale that diverges as the system size goes to infinity. And finally, as with all phases of matter, we'd like for there to be some well-defined notion of rigidity, which means that the behavior that we're talking about is robust to small locality preserving perturbations of either the state or the dynamical update rule. We do not, we don't want the phase of matter to be sort of, you know, you know, a very, very specific point in phase space where if you perturb the Hamiltonian a little bit, that particular feature totally disappears. Okay, so these are kind of three ingredients. And I'd like to claim that even with these three ingredients, in particular as defined here, time crystals have been known for well over a century. So let me start with, um, with a particular example. And the example perhaps that will be very familiar, hopefully to this audience, at least I chose it to be familiar to this audience, is the example of the logistic map. So in the logistic map, I think many of you have heard the, um, the phrase, you know, it exhibits a period doubled route to chaos. If you haven't, doesn't matter. I'll explain it in just a second. But it's a dynamical system on a uh, degree of freedom x that is captured by an iterative map. So this map phi, you should think about literally as implementing the discrete time update rule. So you apply phi, and you call it one period. You apply phi again, and that's the second period. Phi a third time, and that's the third period. So the iterated map phi to the m is precisely a discrete time update rule and it takes the form Rx times one minus X. And I plot it here for us 
just the, 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 the states of X as a function of R. And it turns out you can already see this, that for an appropriate choice of R, there exists a finite volume of initial states X, which exhibit period doubled oscillations between two fixed points of the logistic map. Super simple. So the statement is that if you start X here and you apply phi, this, this map, it takes you to this point. And if you apply it again, it goes back and forth. So at some level, this is kind of the most you know, trivial version of a time crystal. You have basically, indeed, a discrete time update rule phi, which is a period one, for example, but the state X only returns back to itself every period two. So this would be an example that at least at the level of the definition of subharmonic oscillations satisfies exactly what we said before. Indeed, so it checks, you know, the second checkbox. And because there's a finite volume of initial states near that state in that whole region, um, for example, of the first bifurcation that I showed, it's also by definition rigid. Uh, the behavior is, is going to be stable to small perturbations of either the state or the update rule. But it turns out you might say, well, and this is something that people often say in the literature, but I think is not, I'll be honest, and I think is not quite right. Um, people might say, oh, well, you know, there isn't a well-defined thermodynamic limit. You know, it's sort of, you know, one, it's a, it's a single degree of freedom that has this map on top of it. And usually I'd like to think about phases of matter as being a many particle system. But it turns out that in the dynamical systems math literature, uh, one can easily solve that problem. And there's a whole field known as coupled map lattices. And these coupled map lattices, for example, are simply, you know, you can imagine a nearest neighbor connected logistic map uh, where the degrees of freedom couple to each other in some non-trivial way. And you will still see, um, in this case is actually period qua quadrupled oscillations. So the point here is that even if you require, if you want there to be a well-defined thermodynamic limit, you can simply couple these various dynamical systems and these various iterative maps together to get this type of subharmonic oscillation in a so-called many body system. But at some level, all of the dynamics there can be understood and inherited from the single particle problem already. So it turns out that at this point in the talk, I would argue that stable, rigid, many body time translation symmetry of a discrete time translation symmetry has been known for an extremely long time. And by that definition, time crystals have also been known for an extremely long time, which means that the question that is interesting and non-trivial has to be a little bit distinct from that. And my claim is that the moral of the story comes from the fact that whether or not we have an, it's an interesting question or the difficulty of breaking a discrete time translation symmetry really, really, really deeply depends on the class of dynamical system that you consider. And in particular, the class of the dynamical system, I mean, basically, what exactly are the rules that govern the equations of motion, okay? And so I claim that for a periodically driven physical system, so think again, many particle interacting system, either classical or quantum at this point in time, that's periodically shaken in some way so that the equations of motion come back to themselves only after a period t, and I'm going to ask that this type of a system has dynamics that are, in quotes, measure preserving. In the quantum case, it's sort of, you know, very easy to understand what I mean by that. I mean, unitary dynamics, basically, or things that satisfy, um, yeah, things that satisfy fluctuation dissipation effectively. But, you know, measure preserving is really most well understood in terms of Louisville's theorem for classical systems, where basically literally the kind of overall volume of phase space is conserved as a function of evolution. And that's kind of the intuition that you want to you want to have. Measure preserving really refers to the lack of information loss in the system, um, in the, yeah, at, at a basic level. So, just to give you a sense um, that even with this idea, there are many many different definitions of dynamical systems. I'll say that you know you could imagine that there's you know a dynamical system where the rules are fundamentally you know closed Hamiltonian dynamics. So we have no coupling to an external bath. We have integration of Hamilton's equations to govern our classical dynamics, and there's you know, many interacting particles. You could also have a situation where you have uh, unitary quantum dynamics. This would be more like a closed quantum mechanical system 
where the dynamics are given by a unitary time evolution under the Hamiltonian. You can also open the system to a path. In the classical system, oftentimes we think of Langevin dynamics, and that will be a topic that comes back in the talk. In the context of Langevin dynamics, we now have a classical system that we imagine is coupled to a finite temperature bath, but crucially, the bath provides both friction, so dissipation, as well as noise that satisfies the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And the analog of that open system for the quantum case is, of course, the Limbladian dynamics. And my claim is that in each of these systems, the breaking of time translation symmetry in a periodically driven system is extremely, extremely subtle and almost never happens, um, except for this cases that I'll talk about. And within this context, I want to emphasize that the example that we just got, went through, which I would say is a, is a totally fine definition example of a time crystal, the logistic map or the coupled map lattice is precisely the example of a dynamical system or dynamical class, which is not measure preserving. In that particular case, basically, if you start you know, with a finite volume of your initial conditions, the logistic map always contracts you to a single point in phase space. So effectively what happens there is that one basically has dissipation, but no noise. And the simplest way that I like to think about it is that it corresponds to the limiting case of Langevin dynamics where one's effectively coupled to a zero temperature bath. Okay, so I hope at least I've, well, I see some smiles and some nods, which is a good sign. Um, I hope I've at least been able to kind of explain for you what the question is and when the question is non-trivial. And I'll try to now zoom in a little bit more and give a little bit more of an intuitive feeling for why that question is non-trivial. In particular, you might naturally ask, you know, what exactly is it about the last decade or so that people have now started to become interested in these periodically driven phases of matter? It seems like, you know, the question is very, very well defined. So um, what exactly is the, is the motivating interest? And I would say, that the reason why people have started to become interested is because of a mantra that's been around for a long time, which is that as a very, very general rule of thumb, if you have a interacting si system of particles and you periodically shake them, the generic uh, final state for that system is going to heat up. And the intuition is that very, very simple. You're shaking the system, so there's be work being done on the system, and that means that the many particle system will absorb energy from the periodic driving field and it will slowly or quickly heat to an infinite temperature featureless state. And this is really kind of the consequence of a slightly more broad idea in the context of statistical mechanics that's applied to periodically driven systems and that's the notion of ergodicity. And in particular, I would say that you know, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis or the ergodic hypothesis for a periodically driven system is that all interacting driven systems will heat up and mix to infinite temperature. And at infinite temperature, the density matrix is, you know, okay, in a quantum system, the density matrix is basically just the identity and there can be no non-trivial order at infinite temperature. So the key thing that allows for one to explore this notion of time translation symmetry breaking in a periodically driven system is that one must have a way to break ergodicity. And I claim that as sort of a simple statement that really this breaking of ergodicity is a very, very non-trivial facet, but that whenever you're able to break ergodicity, that generically you should find a route to time translation symmetry breaking and thus what people are calling time crystalline order. So let me just emphasize that um, you know, a, a little table in this, in this regard, that it turns out that in the context of periodically driven systems, there are now a number of known ways to either break or delay ergodicity, which either which have lifetimes that can be parametrically controlled either by the system size or other control parameters. And it turns out somewhat unsurprisingly, given the picture and the conjecture that I painted in the previous slide, for each of these different ways of breaking or delaying the onset of ergodicity or the onset of heating, it turns out there's kind of a different flavor of a time crystal. And these different time crystals in essence are stabilized by different forms and different met microscopic methods of ergodicity breaking. 
I'm not going to go through them all, but I will go through just a couple of flavors of um, of 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 ergodicity breaking strategies before I zoom into the specific topic that um, I'd like to focus the rest of the talk on. So let me start in the quantum setting because that's the setting that we won't end our talk on. So setting is quantum system of multiple interacting particles. Oftentimes people are thinking about spin one half electrons um, where the electronic motion is frozen. So it's just the spin degree of freedom. In the language, in the modern language of quantum information, it's really, you know, quantum system of interacting qubits, for example. And the question, of course, in this context is, can the system settle into a many body state such that as a function of looking at um, a correlation function like this, the correlation function exhibits, for example, periodicity only after some n over here. So for example, for a period double system, n would be two, and this would correspond, oh yeah, exactly. Um, this would correspond to, uh, I apologize. This, is, this n is, uh, is taking the infinite time limit. So the lifetime here basically should uh, be infinitely long. And in particular, the periodicity of here would be given by sort of whenever this particular correlation function comes back to itself. So the strategy that perhaps the first place people started thinking about time crystals was in the context of um, time translation symmetry being stabilized by something called many body localization. This is a really, really beautiful idea that kind of came out of the Princeton condensed matter theory group um, many years, not many years ago, but some number of years ago. And the idea was basically that if one has enough disorder in the system, that it becomes possible to actually prevent the system, even a static system, to start off a static system from um, thermalizing at late times, and that there would be, for example, no transport in the system if there is a sufficiently large amount of disorder. And I'll say that it turns out that many body localization is extremely subtle. And even now there are many open questions about its stability in, in dimensions greater than one. I think there are some mathematical proofs in certain models um, under kind of very reasonable physical assumptions for the stability of many body localization in one dimensional interacting systems. But I think even in generic one dimensional systems, there is no proof that many body localization survives. So it turns out that many body localization in a periodically driven system is even more subtle. Again, I think there's no formal proof that MBL is stable in such a periodically driven, even one dimensional system, but there is some numerical and experimental evidence for this stability. And the idea here is that if you have enough disorder in a periodically driven system and you can fully prevent thermalization and ergodicity, then you can prevent the system from heating up to infinite temperature as I mentioned in the previous slide, and that this would lead to a way that would allow for one to see a stable breaking of time translation symmetry. And there's actually um, two recent experimental papers, one from the, from a, the Timiniao group in Delft, another uh, collaboration between Bidiga Kamani's group and the Google Quantum AI team, which demonstrated some signatures of this many body localized version of a time crystal. Another strategy that has um, seen quite a lot of work in the quantum setting is the notion of pre-thermalization. Here, the idea is extremely simple as well. The idea is that if your driving frequency of the periodic shaking is sufficiently large, that in order for the many body system to absorb a single quanta of energy from the drive, it needs to rearrange in multiple different ways. So this process of energy absorption is pretty high order in perturbation theory. And because of that, the time scale for getting to heating and for ergodicity being restored is something that can be exponentially controlled in the frequency of the drive divided by the energy scale of the locally interacting system. And so this gives a parametrically exponentially long time scale where one can observe time crystal order. And again, certain signatures of this type of behavior have, have been observed in some really nice experiments, in this case from Chris Monroe's group at the University of Maryland. Finally, something that will kind of become the heart of, uh, of our talk today is really um, a strategy of whether or not one can use dissipation in some way to be able to stabilize the system as well. 
And in this context, the idea is super simple that when you periodically drive the system or floquet the system, because you heat the system to infinite temperature, you need a way to somehow remove that excess energy that's being absorbed. So if you couple to a cold thermal bath, is it possible that one can actually stabilize in some steady state, this type of a discrete time translation symmetry breaking? And this will you know, ultimately be a topic that we explore a little bit further. So I should emphasize that for the remainder of the talk, I will actually be thinking about um, classical many body systems. So we're no longer looking at unitary time evolution. We're just simply integrating Hamilton's equations of motion. But the question is the same. The question is whether or not one can have a periodically driven interacting classical time crystal in d equals one or higher that is allowed to skirt ergodicity in some way. And let me just emphasize going back to this picture that we had of the three strategies in the quantum case that I briefly mentioned, many body localization is out as far as we know. We don't know of a many particle classical system that is localizable because localization at some level requires the discreteness of quantum mechanical energy levels. But it seems like recent work suggests that either pre-thermalization and what I'll talk about and dissipation could be reasonable strategies to try to stabilize such behavior in a many body classical system. Okay. So in the last half hour of the talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about two recent stories that I've thought about quite a lot. And in particular, both of the stories will be in the context of Langevin dynamics. So you know, we'll return to this picture where I said that the question of discrete time translation symmetry breaking is most non-trivial in systems where the dynamics and the equations of motion are measure preserving. And specifically, we will work with this third class of Langevin dynamics. So open classical many body systems. And we will take two strategies to attack this problem. The first is the one that I'm most familiar with as a physicist, which is just to try the most simple and generic many body system and see if it works with the intuition that if nature you know, deems it so, it should work. It turns out the answer will be that it doesn't quite work. It gets extremely close to being a time crystal, but does not quite get there. And the second part of the talk will try to remedy that by taking a particular insight from really beautiful results. And I would say more the computing literature on cellular automata, but I'll try to motivate everything very cleanly. So um, yeah, let me emphasize one more time. I, I, I hope I'm going slowly enough and you know doing this in a way that people are, are, are digesting, but please interrupt um, if, there are, if there are questions at this point. So the first part of this strategy is I'll literally look at something that I think all of us have thought about maybe even beginning of college, high school, which is you know, parametric resonance of simple coupled pendula. And as I mentioned before, the final statement will be that it's not quite a time crystal, but we will find along the way an extremely intriguing non-equilibrium phase transition, which I actually don't understand very much about. So what's the question? Let's imagine that we have a base system, which is extremely simple. We have nonlinear oscillators. I've taken the nonlinear oscillator here to be a pendulum. The pendulum, for example, are arranged in a one-dimensional chain, and they're coupled to each other, in this case, ferromagnetically. And we imagine that they are periodically driven at some frequency omega d with a drive amplitude delta. This is literally you know, the starting point for parametric resonance of nonlinear oscillators. But our goal is to understand the stability of a very specific subharmonic response, a very specific subharmonic response or a specific parametric resonance in such a system under generic Langevin dynamics. So I'll add an extra forcing term to the Hamiltonian that includes eta, which is a dissipation or a friction term you can think about. And also there will be a stochastic um, C of T, which really represents finite temperature noise, and that will satisfy the fluctuation dissipations theorem, such that temperature basically relates the amplitude of this two-point correlation function multiplied by delta, by, by eta. So it turns out that we will start again by zooming into a very specific setting and trying to sort of zoom out to make the question more and more non-trivial at each stage. To start off, we're going to think about a single parametrically driven pendulum, so not a many-body system, and we're going to ask about its behavior at zero temperature. 
So where the bath is not at finite temperature, but you basically just get dissipation. So this question has an insanely long history, um, dating you know, all the way back to, to Faraday waves, basically. And the point is that at t equals zero, it's extremely well-known phenomenon that we can have subharmonic parametric resonances and that a force pendulum generically can exhibit oscillations at a fraction of the driving frequency. I just plotted here super simply, you know, the pendulum's oscillations in blue and the drive amplitude in green, showing that we basically see subharmonic oscillations. And if you looked, for example, at the position of the pendulum, uh, with blue being sort of, you know, it in the right and red being it to the left, you'd basically see that it oscillates as a function of time, period doubling the underlying drive motion. Just for visual simplicity, I will actually always, um, since I, we know we're going to look at period doubling, I will always go into the frame that's rotating at the period doubled solution. So here in that frame, basically in the rotating frame, basically the pendulum will basically look like it's fully blue. So it's always basically sort of going back and forth, but it'll look blue. So just for the purposes of the talk, when you see, at least for this section, when you see solid colors, that's evidence of subharmonic period doubled response. And when you see no colors, that's the evidence that you don't have any time crystal response. So of course, one doesn't always get um, a parametric resonance at nu equals one half. In particular, if you make the ratio of the damping to the driving amplitude large, you can see that the pendulum will simply decouple from the drive and it'll damp away such that if you looked at the same oscillations, they would basically disappear and it become white. So again, blue will be period double time crystal. White, you should think about as I've tuned my parameter regime into a regime that does not have the parametric resonance. It's just a disordered phase. So at t equals zero, it turns out it's extremely well known that there exist sharp boundaries between regions with and without subharmonic responses. There exists literal phase transitions between these boundaries. But we can now make the question slightly more difficult and ask what happens to this response or to these boundaries if you go to a finite temperature? And in the finite temperature setting, all that means is that in the equations of motion initially, that correlation function for the noise basically is a finite temperature T, which is non-zero. The intuition, of course, from physics very generally, and actually I think you know, really you know, based on you know, work that, that maybe some members of the audience have actually worked on, is in fact that if you have um, a zero dimensional system, so in this case, a single parametrically driven pendulum, that such a system cannot exhibit a sharp phase transition at any finite temperature. So it cannot exhibit any sharp phase transition at a finite temperature. And we'll check very, we can check very simply numerically whether or not this is the case. So to be super clear, what I'm going to do is here, I'm gonna use a diagnostic of period doubling or parametric resonance, which is extremely common in the literature. It's called the velocity order parameter. And the idea is that if the position of the pendulum is oscillating at some frequency Q, that the derivative of the velocity will pull that frequency out. So if you then divide by that expected frequency and subtract that from the original driving frequency, if you expect it to be period doubled, thus omega d minus two, the velocity order parameter should be zero. And if it's any non-zero value, that means you do not have period doubling in the system, right? And you can see as a function of lambda, whereas at zero temperature, you would have seen a sharp phase boundary, a sharp jump in this velocity order parameter. At any finite temperature, when you do the numerical simulations, you can kind of immediately see that there's a very, very smooth crossover between the region where there is period doubling and the region where there is no period doubling. Okay. And it turns out we will now sort of, you know, zoom out, you know, we will now make the question even more interesting by going to the many body setting. So we started out zero temperature, one oscillator. Then we went to finite temperature, one nonlinear oscillator. And now we're going to zero temperature again, but a one dimensional coupled chain of nonlinear oscillators. And it turns out the answer at t equals zero is that the behavior is actually extremely similar to the single pendulum case. In the literature, it's often called something, it's often called subharmonic entrainment. But what you can see in these coupled oscillator systems is again, that at low values of the damping to driving ratio, you have a time crystal. At high values of the damping to driving ratio, you don't have a time crystal. 
And at zero temperature, there is a sharp phase boundary, a phase transition that distinguishes between the two regimes of low and high lambda. And the question now is, is there anything sharp for a one-dimensional system at finite temperature? So now we're zooming into the finite temperature question, or is it again just a crossover like the zero-dimensional system? And let me emphasize once again that in equilibrium, any sharp phase transition is impossible. So the breaking of a discrete translation, a discrete symmetry breaking in a one-dimensional finite temperature system is impossible. But of course, this is a statement that fundamentally is equilibrium physics. And we're in a very, very different situation now because we have periodic driving. So it turns out that if we look at high temperatures, again, at the velocity order parameter as a function of our tuning, which is the ratio of the damping to the driving amplitude, it looks very much like the velocity order parameter, again, has a smooth crossover between the period double time crystal and the no period double disorder phase. But when you go to low but finite temperatures, you find that it looks like there's a hysteresis loop that emerges. And as you, go, as, as you go through this phase transition more slowly, as you increase the amount of time used to go through the phase transition, it looks like the hysteresis loop slowly closes until we have a phase transition, what looks to be a first order dynamical phase transition between the period doubled phase at low values of lambda and the disordered phase at the high values of lambda. So again, it kind of looks like there may be a sharp boundary emerging at low temperatures. One can um, test this hypothesis a little bit more carefully. Ooh, I believe Arthur is asking a question, but um, I think you might be muted, Arthur. Are, are these numerical or, simulations know. you're showing us? Yeah, exactly. They're numerical simulation, simulations. It's a very simple um, numerical integration, like numerical stepper integration of uh, the Langevin equations. That's exactly right. So, um, so one can run exactly as Arthur said, we can run, we can run a very simple numerical experiment here. And the numerical experiment is to see whether or not there really seems to be a phase transition here is to stay at low temperatures and to go into the period doubled phase. So to set your parameter regime lambda somewhere in the disordered phase and to set up an initial domain wall between the 1D system where there's a trivial phase to the left and a time crystal to the right, and to allow the system to evolve with lambda large. And whenever you do that, you see that the disordered phase always wins out. It always eats the time crystal. On the other hand, if you started out, for example, with the parameter regime in the time crystalline phase, and you again set up the same domain wall, you can see it's white here and blue here, that as a function of time, then basically it turns out the time crystal always wins. I should emphasize these lambdas are for a very, very, very small regime of parameter space zoomed in on this kind of pinkish region over here. And if you're very, very close to approximately where the phase transition happens, you can see that for a long period of time, there's competition between these two phases as, um, as the system dynamically evolves. So it turns out the moral of the story is that we think that there is a phase diagram for this classical Langevin system, where it looks like there is kind of a time crystalline phase, where at low temperatures, indeed, there is a dynamical phase transition between the time crystal and non-time crystal. But at high temperatures, there's a route in lambda T space to go from this period doubled order to the non-time crystalline order, because we saw that there was only a crossover at high temperatures. And this should very much reminisce for you about one of the first slides that I showed, where it looks like there is a way to go from the liquid to the gas without going through a phase transition. And partly because of that, it turns out that the lifetime of this time crystal is not infinitely long. So the order does not survive for an infinitely long thermodynamic time scale. Instead, it's controlled by some effective barrier relative to the temperature of the system or the temperature of the bath. So you can get an exponentially long lived time crystal controlled by the temperature, but not what I think people would call a quote unquote true time crystal, which breaks time translation symmetry out to infinitely long times with a time scale that diverges as something like e to the system size. So 
this kind of was, but at the same time, it's a very interesting non-equilibrium phase transition which happens here, which is not allowed in equilibrium systems. And I have no idea whether or not there's a field theory that presumably describes the critical point here. So the second part of the talk that I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to move through now is whether or not one can be a little bit more clever. I still want to remain in the same dynamical class, which is Langevin dynamics, but I want to ask, uh, but I want to be a little bit more clever about the nature of the Hamiltonian. And the question is, if we did something more fancy than simply take coupled nonlinear oscillators, could we push this time scale to infinity so that one really does have a true time crystalline phase in that dynamical symmetry class of Langevin dynamics? I will take a little aside for a second and tell you a story about the existence of time crystals, the provable existence of time crystals in probabilistic cellular automata. And then I will, I promise to come back to Langevin dynamics, but for a little while, you'll have to hold your physical intuition and just, you know, we'll, we'll have to be comfortable working with, you know, probabilistic cellular automata for just a little while. But I claim that ultimately the results from PCAs and theoretical computer science and computing prove at some level that time crystals exist in any dimension D greater than zero um, in this class of Langevin dynamics. Okay, so what is the intuitive connection between why we started thinking about um, cellular automata? There's actually very deep connections that were made by Charlie Bennett and people in the 80s. And you know, my collaborators and I have kind of rediscovered in the context of time crystals. Um, but there is a very simple intuitive connection. The Langevin dynamics that we've been talking about of these linear oscillators are a perfect example of what's known as a continuous time Markov process. And it turns out that there are very, very deep results from cellular automata. And it turns out that these results are um, really effectively for discrete time Markov processes, where, where for example, one has you know, a probability distribution over a set of classical variable sigma at time t that is somehow updated by an update rule m to a new probability distribution at some later time t plus one. So again, same, clearly the same setting that we've started off all along. You have basically a discrete time update rule, but this time it's given by some Markov process, or if you think about, you know, your simple drawings in computer science class, it's given by some simple, you know, cellular automata rule set, which is captured by m. But one very important thing that I emphasized is that if you have an update rule like that with no noise, that you automatically get a, a time crystal. A computer program that's not noisy, that runs the program zero, flip to one, flip to zero, flip to one, the not version of a program is a, is a time crystal in that language. So it's very important to ask ourselves within the Langevin class that one also has noise, that if you think about finite temperature, you do have friction and dissipation, but you also have a corresponding amount of stochasticity coming from the many body noise. So the proper thing to think about is really something that's called a probabilistic cellular automata, where the transition rule is not perfect, but it's a cellular automata transition rule of random errors. So sometimes your classical variable is supposed to go to a different state, but just doesn't listen. And that happens with some probability and the errors you know, satisfy some you know, relationship in terms of how likely they are um, and what their correlations are. So the setting that we're going to think about is probabilistic cellular automata. And it turns out somewhat magically that um, the probabilistic cellular automatas, and it is really stated in this language, are well known to support ergodicity breaking without fine tuning. And as I mentioned, I think about a time crystal as really requiring ergodicity breaking because at some level, you need to remember which subharmonic orbit you're in like where you go in zero, one, zero, or one, zero, one. So that memory is some, in some sense has to require ergodicity break. But PCAs are extremely well known to support such ergodicity breaking. And in fact, um, the simplest example of such uh, an ergodicity breaking PCA that I know about is the TOOM model from Andre TOOM, also known as the Northeast Corner model. And here the statement is that basically, um, one has uh, a set of variables living on these squares 
which are Ising variables. So they can either be plus one or negative one, represented either as red or blue. And the next phase, um, the, the next state of a particle depends on a majority vote of itself and its northeast corner neighbors, hence the northeast corner rule. And it turns out what's proven for this is that there exist two stable distributions, aka all red and all blue, very similar to an Ising magnet, all red and all blue, which would be all up and all down, without the need for symmetry. This is the remarkable thing that, you know, if you have a, a magnet, for example, you know, that has an Ising symmetry, so the notion of there being a low temperature phase is precisely that that symmetry is broken by the magnet picking either up or down. But of course, if you had, for example, noise in your universe that slightly preferentially always flipped down to up, you will always end up at the all up state. So if you have biased noise in that type of a symmetry breaking scenario, you always only end with one stable distribution. But the remarkable thing for Toombs model is that even if you have noise that is biased, so red likes to flip to blue slightly more likely than blue likes to flip to red, it turns out that there are still two stable distributions. If you make a whole region of red and a little island of blue, that will get corrected to red. And if you make a whole region of blue and a little island of red, that will get corrected to blue, okay? It's really, the intuition is that you're implementing this Northeast corner rule is kind of implementing via this majority vote, kind of a simple, simple version of error correction. It turns out that for many, many years, it was conjectured that such a probabilistic cellular automata in 1D cannot break ergodicity. That was something that went by the name of the positive rates conjecture. But I think in probably the mid 80s or so, certainly the early 90s, um, Peter Gotch uh, at BU proved a counterexample to the positive rates conjecture. So it is now known that there are ergodicity breaking probabilistic cellular automata in both one dimensional system as well as two dimensional systems. Haven't yet explained the connection to a time crystal, but it'll become pretty obvious. I just want to run a simple uh, Q basic simulation of what uh, of what the of what the of what the two model does. So here, um, the two distributions are purple and yellow, and you can see that if I just start with an island of purple, that actually it gets automatically corrected by this northeast corner rule to the stable distribution, which is yellow, and it turns out. If I now, for example, want a time crystal, all I need to do is apply what I call the pi tomb rule, which is after every error correcting step, I flip all the spins by 180 degrees or I interchange yellow and, uh, yellow and purple. So what that looks like is precisely that now you still correct that minority island and that's key. In an Ising magnet or a system that did not not have this error correction protocol, once you flip to the other one, you will have errors proliferate. But here in this case, because you have two stable distributions where errors are corrected in both cases, you immediately have a stable time crystal. And it turns out that you end up getting, at least for this PCA, the cellular automata models, a time crystal with an infinite autocorrelation time that is robust to all noise and all local perturbations, including those that break the original time translation symmetry of the drive. So here I'm just adding some random errors um, into the model such that it's actually a PCA. And you can see again that you end up um, going to the stable time crystal times time crystal. But of course, I should um, now bring us back to uh, the, land, the land of physics away from PCAs. And my claim is that it turns out that there is a very, very natural way to translate between any PCA and a Hamiltonian with Langevin dynamics, such that the Langevin effectively implements the probabilistic facet of it, and the Hamiltonian tries to capture the transition rules. I won't go into very, very much detail, but the intuition is basically that in order for the PCA to have memory of the state as a function of time, that we end up having there being two sets of particles one set of particles in the Hamiltonian system that kind of serves as a memory for the second set of particles. So the idea is that, you know, you more or less can think about, you know, the cellular automata of having a tape, you know, which we're sort of updating the rules. And here, what ends up playing the memory of that tape will be particle A at step one, and then particle B at step two. 
So particle A basically, the particles A remember the initial state and then they implement the transition rule on B. And then particle B in the next step remembers the rule and implements the transition step on A. So it's just some way to basically generate a PCA using Hamiltonian Langevin dynamics. I apologize if you hear my daughter screaming in the background. Um, so uh, yeah, so it turns out that we can literally simulate, again, numerically simulate both situations where one starts with a perfect PCA and one sees immediately a sharp phase transition between the pi tomb time crystal and the disordered phase, as well as a simulation of the Langevin, the, uh, a numerical simulation of the Langevin dynamics, which are themselves supposed to simulate the PCA. And you can see that as you increase, turns out this is more or less like a potential, land, potential energy offset um, V, you can get very, very close to the phase transition that exists in the PCA. So we think that there is very good reason to believe that in these Floquet Langevin dynamics, if you are more careful about the way that you construct your Hamiltonian, building intuition from these PCAs, that you should be able to realize a stable time crystal in this way with an infinitely long-lived autocorrelation time. One very, very, very subtle thing, which I spent an extremely long time on but have not been able to do, is to check whether or not the noise that you get from Hamiltonian dynamics associated with periodic driving and Langevin noise satisfies the error model associated with Andre Tum or Peter Gotch's construction. So um, uh, I put it in, your, in the bedroom. All, both bedroom, both laptops are in the bedroom. So. Sorry, the, the dangers of giving a talk at home. I apologize for that. Um, so it turns out that one can, um, yeah, so, so it turns out that proving that the noise that one gets from these types of dynamics, that they satisfy the correlations that the errors must satisfy and Tum and Gotch are actually ex extremely subtle and I haven't been able to do it yet. So let me just end um, with, a, with, a, with a quick outlook and mention a couple of questions that I think are interesting and that I'm thinking about, but I haven't, really made much progress on. I've been wondering for a long time whether or not one can think about, um, one can think about these Floquet-Langevin existence of time crystals in some sort of a pre-thermal setting, whether it's really, one can understand it as the emergence of this extremely long, exponentially long time scale, but with respect to a well-defined static Hamiltonian that's pre-thermal. It's not clear to me. I mean, at one level, it's not exactly clear that there is a Hamiltonian that the system is pre-thermal with respect to. And secondly, it's not really clear that, you know, that the pre-thermal limit is the same because as we take dissipation and temperature to zero in that limit, there's sort of zero work done per driving cycle. Whereas in the pi limit, each flow K cycle has to error correct in some way. And this means it kind of takes a constant amount of horsepower for each of the flow K cycles. But I do think it's an extremely natural question whether there is a construction where one can get kind of a natural pre-thermal limit. I just, I don't know the answer to that. Let me just end with two outlook slides and emphasize that really um, the way I think about this question in terms of the breaking of a time translation symmetry is very much in terms of the fact that we're really discovering a zoology that in you know open stochastic systems, there's you know, questions at zero temperature and non-zero temperature with different strategies for stabilizing time translation symmetry breaking. That was the focus of today's talk. But that in fact, in closed deterministic systems, quantum and classical, there are again, different strategies for stabilizing this type of ergodicity breaking. And I do think that if one has a generic way to either delay or break ergodicity in a many particle system, I think that one should be able to get this type of symmetry breaking that we've talked about today. Um, let me just uh, end by, by acknowledging the people who did the work. Um, this, uh, the first part on the nonlinear oscillators was worked together with Chay Nayak and Leon in Santa Barbara. The second part was work done with my student Francisco Machado, um, who actually will be a postdoc uh, at ITAMP um, starting next fall and Chuntao Zhuang, who is a postdoc with us and now is at the University of Arizona. And all of this was done with my very, very good friend, Mike Salatel. Uh, thanks so much for your attention. So thank you, Norman. Thank you for the very beautiful introduction to 
a complicated field, which sounds so interesting in physics and has many, many open mathematical problems. I'm sure that there's going to be a great deal of discussion because there are many questions to be answered. So I'll open the floor up. Bert, you, you have your hand up. Okay, thank you. Um, beautiful talk, hey, really very clear. Um, I, I had a, a question, just going back to this one dimensional uh, chain of pendulum example that you give. Uh, and you, you, you made a statement, which I didn't quite understand, that you thought that there, there was some kind of critical point, that, that you had a first order phase transition, and then uh, this is with the noise and, and uh, finite temperatures. Uh, and, and yet at the same time, you were saying, well, uh, it, it's, it seemed to me like you were saying it's only pre-thermal, that is to say, at any if I understood what you were saying, and I, what I would have thought in analogy with just an ordinary equilibrium one-dimensional system, is that at low temperatures, of course, you can get something you know, like an Ising model will look like it has a phase transition, but eventually, um, you look at long enough time, look long enough distance scales, you'll find, ah, now there's a, a domain wall. And so I just have an exponentially long Correlation length, there's no real first order transition. And here it seemed to me also that if I uh, I get something that looks like there's a first order transition over some very long time, but the time is always finite at any given temperature. Am I misunderstanding something? That's that that, that that's correct. So the but the thing is that the trans exactly that's exactly correct. So it turns out that um that in the domain, the, yeah, just the picture of domain walls is correct. That in fact, that in what I call the time crystal-ish phase. That if you look at, um, if you like, you know, look at the proliferation of domain walls in the time crystal, you know, zero, one, one, zero domain walls, um, that you only have a uh, a time scale that is exponentially long lived. It's not an infinite autocorrelation time. But the thing that jumps across that transition, as far as we can tell, is uh, is that the behavior is either exponentially activated or not. So as you basically go across, if you sit at finite temperature and you try to go across that phase transition um, at low temperatures and you go across that phase transition in the non-time crystal phase, it's, it's a question of basically whether or not delta, I think, goes to zero or not. So is there an exponential, I mean, is the lifetime exponentially activated in that region or is it you know, not exponentially activated? And that's the thing that I think jumps across the phase transition, even though in principle, you know, at infinitely long times, even in the time crystal-ish phase, you always have a finite number for the autocorrelation time. So you're saying the, the, the critical point would be a point at which the, the, the delta goes to zero or- uh, Yeah, I, mean, I think that's right. That, that's my, that's my under, that's, that's our understanding of the, of what we've seen. That's right. That's exactly right. But any, yeah, any, I think, I don't know if you remember this. I mean, I think, I think I mentioned this question to you in your office. I mean, maybe, maybe like six months or a year ago, and I still haven't sorted out how exactly to think about that critical point. Right. So are there any other questions? Um, for, perhaps I can ask a question John? Yes. Um, Yeah, your setup seems, like it would be very suitable for, uh, for giving some additional intuition as to what's going on in hybrid Monte Carlo simulations where you've got some, you introduce some Hamiltonian dynamics and you're interested in maybe close to a first order phase transition. Uh, is there, have you thought about that type of setting or is there, I'll be, is I'll there be a possible totally time crystal that we could see in that type of setting? Yeah, I'll be totally honest and, and show, show my naivety. I, I, I haven't really, I don't know much about hybrid Monte Carlo, I guess. So I'm not exactly sure, but I mean, if there- It's just Hamiltonian dynamics and, and which that you've artificially introduced to uh, uh, on top of a, uh, a Markov chain, essentially. It's very similar, uh, it seems very similar, but uh, it's type right. of thing that's think, used I to analyze- that is, I mean, if I, if I if I if I if I understand correctly, I think this is. I mean, yeah, I think the example that I gave is a is a is a slightly restricted version of a more general setting that you're talking about, which is you have like a, a Markov a Markov chain, but you also have Hamiltonian dynamics on top of that. And I think that 
my sense is that at, at some level, you know, one should be able to see time crystals in that setting as well, precisely because, you know, even in the sort of, you know, kind of purely Hamiltonian Langevin dynamics, one should be able to see it. I don't know whether or not there's some deep sense, I mean, it'd be interesting to ask whether or not that general setting kind of allows one to have either more stability or somehow a different type of symmetry breaking, but yeah, that's not, that's not as clear to me. Thank you. Ike? Um, I can quick. Let me, uh, let me unmute, okay? Uh, so an order parameter uh, goes from uh, say zero to one, either continuously or abruptly, abruptly depending on whether depending you're having on a, a sec second order or first order uh, phase transition. So mm -hmm. the arguments you have been making depend upon the size of the order parameter. That is, do they, do they make sense if you're right near TC, the critical temperature? Yeah, so I think, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I think the point is that, uh, so maybe let me make two statements. Indeed, the order parameter for, for the time crystal, um, yeah, you can think about it as, you know, the height of the Fourier transform of subharmonic oscillations, it will uh, go from zero to one. And uh, and it turns out in the non-time, in the disorder phase, it's zero. In the time crystal phase, it'll have some finite value, doesn't have to be one in that case. And at TC, we find that indeed that order parameter, it, we depending on actually the system that we look at, the order parameter can look like it goes continuously or sometimes it can look like it jumps. As far as I understand, in the case that I know the best, which is the disordered 1D case, in that case, it looks like uh, the value of the Fourier transform, the value of the time constant order parameter turns on continuously near TC. But I don't know, I mean, there's no reason to me why it has to always be continuous, but the context that I know the best, it does seem to be continuous. But these are unfortunately very small scale numerical simulations. It's hard to say anything exact about the system. And I don't know that there really are large scale experiments yet that can answer the question either. Okay, thank you. So Michael, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. So if you want, maybe I misunderstand it, but to go to the uh, pre-thermal pre Hamiltonian, you can go to the original, your system coupled to the uh, thermal bus. So this is Hamiltonian system. Yeah. And depending on the representation, you can you can look at the zero temperature, positive temperature, or pre thermalization. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So so yeah, I think the I think that language of pre thermalization is the same, but I, I should have been more clear about it. What I'm what I was thinking about, what I was hoping to get out, and I think is probably not possible, is this. So, I mean, what people, I mean, again, it's kind of like a sort of a, it's, it's sort of, I think, a, a nomenclature issue. So in the language of these periodically driven systems, what people call pre-thermalization or a pre-thermal Hamiltonian is, is very simple. They basically do, I think you're almost certainly familiar with this. They do, they have a periodically driven set of equations of motion and they basically do a one over omega expansion. So they do a Magnus expansion and they ask whether or not that Magnus expansion converges or not. And in the pre-thermal regime, basically what you find is that it looks like the expansion is converging until you get very far in the series, until you get exponentially far in the series as a function of a parameter, which is frequency over local energy scale, it looks like it's converging, but then it diverges. And it turns out what people do is they truncate at that uh, diverging point and that they call the pre-thermal Hamiltonian. And that effective Hamiltonian, which is a static object because you've done this Magnus expansion, that object describes the time dynamics for an extremely long period of time. And what I was hoping for exactly as you're suggesting, Michael, is you have a Hamiltonian at Bath. Is there some sense in which I can do a, an expansion in the way the Hamiltonian couples to the Bath such that I can get a static Hamiltonian that describes the dynamics out to, again, very long times. And then I have, I mean, it's an, an exponentially long time as Bert was emphasizing in the in the in the in the pen in the in the nonlinear pendulum case, can I construct that? And I just haven't been able to do that. It somehow seems like there's no really good control parameter to do that expansion with. 
And it's just, it's not clear to me whether or not there is a pre-thermal understanding of that exponentially long time scale in the open system case, as opposed to the closed system case. But again, I might, I might, I might just not be clever enough to get there, but it'd be very cool if there was. I would like that because that somehow would unify everything. Um, but I just, I, I can't, it doesn't work yet. And going to Flaquet Hamiltonia does not help. Does not help, does not help, exactly. It does, as far as, as far as I can tell, it does not help, that's right. Okay. okay. So the other question is about the, maybe you can say a few words about quantum analog of this uh, uh, analysis. Yeah, so- It's just for a long time. exactly word to word. So you replace exactly. Lundgren equation by the Limbladian equation or? Yeah, so, so that, that's exactly right. So maybe I'll, I'll make two statements here. So for a long time, I think when the field sort of first started, there was this magic. I mean, a lot of the experiments that were done initially were on these you know, quantum spin chains in these quantum simulators. And there, there was a feeling that there was something magical about, about time crystal order related to quantum mechanics. I've since grown up and come to the conclusion that there's really nothing intrinsically quantum about time crystal order, um, but at least at the level of what we were just talking about, there is something you know, that's very unique about quantum systems. So in the closed system, I told you there was this pre-thermal, you, know, you do the Floquet Magnus expansion and you have this thing that the series that one over omega expansion that almost converges. In if many body localization is true and you can get a many body localized phase, precisely the intuition for MBL is that it allows the series to converge, period. That it makes this sort of you know, exponential divergence at late times not diverge and allows for that convergence. By contrast, I think that the Limbladian case is just as finicky as the Langevin case. And I think in some sense, you know, at, at some general level, once I open up my quantum system, it kind of feels very classical anyways. I mean, the Limbladian's a little bit different, but I think heuristically, you know, everything kind of follows through. The closed system case is the one place where I think quantum is very different because it gives you this, you know, disorder-based strategy that allows you to have this Floquet Magnus expansion converge. But I don't know that that wins you. I mean, mathematically, it's very important and it really gives you a sharp distinction. But experimentally, you know, infinities are all the same. So it's it's very hard to imagine experimentally that it'll make a difference in how stable or long-lived you see a time crystal for. So if I take quasi-classical limit, uh, it doesn't kind of it doesn't show anything. It just continuously goes into the classical, into That's the classical. That so is the, precisely my feeling. Yep, you from the limb lad, I don't think you'll see anything. Yeah. And what about fluctuations around? It? If you look at the next order in Planck constant. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, my, I, mean, I can tell you, my, my intuition is still the same. I will hold fast to that belief that I think nothing happens, but I don't know. I mean, I don't, I, I, I haven't even done the first order H bar calculation, so I don't know. But I think my intuition is that you won't see anything, you know, jumpy as you go from the quantum to the classical case, at least in the open system context where you have a, where you satisfy fluctuation dissipation. Okay, too bad. <laughs> well, I think we have to thank Norman again for giving us so many interesting questions to work on and uh, I think this will lead to many private discussions of these questions so I hope so um, I'm looking forward we, to it yes and we look forward to your coming back to give us another talk when there's more progress really interesting Sounds thank great. you so much Happy to do it see you next Bert week has to bye figure bye. Out critical point first yeah. <laughs> thanks so much everyone thank you thank you bye bye Bye. Thanks a lot for an excellent talk.